welcome. It's good to have you all here. It's good to have you. So what we wanted to have eventually was to have build up this um, adult education hour enough so that we could have critical mass to have two classes. And so this is, this is great. This is a first um, since I've been here at least. We had more than one offering um, that are both, you know, critical mass. So praise God. That's what we're looking for. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about today, and it's um, a little bit where angels fear to trod, but, you know, that's me. There we go. But, um, but we're going to talk about that. But first, I wanted to, uh, well, let's pray, and then I'm going to make an announcement. Uh, we're going to say it. So let's pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, well, I apologize. I'm sort of shrouded in darkness here, uh, but that's in part why we are having our fundraiser on Tuesday, because in order for you to see the, um, the, the screen, there has to be every other ambient light has to be turned down. And so we're going to, but they've been able to fix this. It's just going to, um, it'll be just a little bit more of an upgrade. But uh, before we get too far afield, I wanted to, uh, Sandra and Bob Bowden, Sandra just grabbed me. Some of you may not know that they have, um, they are the people who uh, graciously um, allow us to be an art museum uh, with the various religious themed art uh, uh, shows that we get to host in our sanctuary. So if you haven't had an opportunity to check this one out, please do. But in, in addition to that, they're uh, connected with something that you may know uh, is called the Museum of the Bible up in D.C., and they're going up this Tuesday, correct? And Sandra, uh, in particular, is going to be interviewed um, and is going to be uh, recorded and be making some speeches at the Museum of the Bible. And so we were going to say a prayer for protection for, for them both, for traveling. Hey, look at them blue. Cool. Um, <clears throat> traveling mercies, but also I don't, you know, and you'll hear me talk more about this, and Kelly actually has been doing research into uh, training to be an exorcist, uh, which I think is uh, quite something. It's not a joke, I'm sure, because, you know, the, what happens when Jesus is around, um, demons freak out. I mean, it's what we see all through the Bible, right? And Christendom, whatever you want to say about it, had a lot of churches and a lot of people praying, even if they, some of them were not really feeling it, and there was a um, spiritual warfare taking place. And as, as Christendom or as uh, faith recedes, we shouldn't be surprised that we see the effects of sort of, um, well, the actual battle that takes place, as Paul says. This battle is not against flesh and blood, but against princes and principalities of the air. You know, there's a spiritual reality to our world that is in many ways much more real than even our physical, right? And so one of the... Um, one of the things we should not be surprised about is things like the Museum of the Bible, or like gospel-believing churches, or like gospel-believing people, not the least of which families, uh, will be under attack. And that's not something that we are frightened of, you know, but it is something we're aware of, you know, because the idea, you know, it's like the old adage, I think Chesterton said, like, don't teach children that there aren't dragons, teach them how to kill them, you know? So it's, like, it's no good teaching people that there isn't something to be afraid of, it's just we need to be more courageous um, than we otherwise would be. And so uh, we want to pray for things like the Museum of the Bible, pray for things like um, gospel-believing churches, and we want to pray right now for the, the Bodens as they, uh, as they go up to um, D.C. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the way you call each of us into unique um, places of witness and of um, uh, testifying to the goodness that you've given us in your Son. And we pray now for traveling mercies for Sandra and Bob. We pray for this Museum of the Bible. We pray for, um, for there to be light, uh, as you promised, to be reflected from your Son from that place um, to the ends of the earth. We pray that each person who comes in there, whether a skeptic or a believer, would be challenged by um, your word, Lord, revealed, revered, and treasured down through the ages as that which gives us our hope. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, Godspeed. Yes. So, uh, okay, we've got a couple of things to talk about today. I want to preface it all by saying I am raising six children um, in a very uh, world that looks incredibly different than the one that I, by myself, was raised in. And in particular, the questions about what it means to be a man and a woman uh, are not only alive and well, but in, in increasingly so 
the, one of the most important things that I think about, not just as a man myself, but as, um, but as a father, training future men, you know, training future women. What should they look for? What should they be like? What shouldn't they look for? What shouldn't they be like? And why? And all of these things uh, are culturally uh, conditioned to a certain degree in each and every generation. You know, I know some of you had a very different upbringing, uh, you know, depending on your age, as a woman or a man. You know, I mean, my great-grandfather was raised in a much different way than I, my grandfather and my father was, and my great-grandson is going to have some different challenges and be raised in a different way than I am, and yet there are some enduring biblical truths that are under assault, both now and throughout history, which we have to recover and re- repristinate and, and preach afresh is what um, the, the ordination vows that I took in the Church of England said, that I would preach the gospel afresh in every generation, not anew, right? But what does that look like, and what does that mean? Well, that is something that I have been challenged and tasked with, not only professionally, as it were, as the, the father of the, of the household of God here, but also, and probably, well, well, frankly, more importantly, the father of my own, my own household. You know, what does it mean to be a husband, to be a, to be a son, to be a brother, to be a father, to be a, um, to be a shepherd, right? And these are questions that if you haven't thought about um, in a while, well, then it may be, um, you may think that it's sort of a, um, well, you should. <laughs> if you haven't thought about it in a while, just turn on the TV and watch men playing uh, volleyball against your, niece, your nieces and smashing, uh, smashing their heads with the volleyball and, and that being okay with everyone and then wondering uh, what went wrong with the world, right? I mean, that's what you need. Or, or field hockey, you know, that's the dangerous one. At any rate, so we're going to get there, but I wanted to just preface all that with saying that this is not exactly a work in progress, but this is a, this is a, the emanation, the, the rector's forum has always been in my ministry, sort of an emanation of what I have, has been laid upon my heart and mind, and I can't stop thinking about it, and I need a place where you can begin to articulate what it is you think, because sometimes you say things and you, you realize you believe something quite different or slightly different, right? But if you never talk about something or if you've never articulated your particular viewpoint on something, well, then you may not actually believe it. But when you begin to articulate it and you begin to, um, to sort of uh, converse, you know, this is what the, the beauty of free speech is. When you begin to actually say something, you realize two things um, could be true. You're either right or you're wrong. You know? and so, but if you just keep quiet, well, then you're, you never really know, right? So anyway, that's a, that's a, and it, so my goal is to help articulate some of these things out in the open so that you can digest them. You don't have to agree with them at all, but then you can begin to articulate them in your own lives uh, with the people you care about, and thus is the proclamation and sort of transmission of the gospel. Okay, it's your weekly reminder. People come to church because you get invited by you, right? Now, this is where you'll hear the sermon today. I am going to um, undercut some of the uh, sort of traditional, which is say, folk religious aspects of Lent and Mardi Gras. That doesn't mean that Lent is not an important and beautiful season, and that doesn't mean that you can't encourage people to um, sort of take on something new, and people don't mind being invited to things like Ash Wednesday services, you know, or Lenten lunch series, or even just church during Lent. You know, people have a holy obligation or feel some sort of pullback, and we don't want to um, manipulate that, but we can utilize it, you know? I mean, it's not, um, it, it's not a, a bad thing to feel some sense of maybe you should be doing something that you ought to be doing, even if when you realize that you could confess and be forgiven of that, that you, would, you could find mercy. But nevertheless, there's something that... Um, so anyway, we want, to, we want to encourage people, particularly during the season. Um, so I told you all this was happening months ago, and it was just it was, now it's becoming that polyamory would become uh, sort of the, the word of the week, and that just simply means fornication. <laughs> That's all that means. It means it means being um, having loose morals, um, and it just uh, poly in any way. So now there's a uh, a TV show uh, called Couple to Thruple. Um, and it's being normalized uh, because this is going to be like The Bachelor, right? And The Bachelor, but instead for The Bachelor, it's going to be couples who invite a third person into their, into their uh, a relationship and then see how the hijinks ensue, right? I mean, this is... Um, but the problem with this, as we said last week, is that this is not only being... That there's, there's a pattern here, is that you begin to normalize what's called defining deviancy down, 
You begin to euphemize some of these things. You know, this isn't fornication or adultery. This is polyamory. And then you begin to define it down, and then you begin to desensitize people to it. And the next thing you know, somebody in your, as we said last week, your golf foursome invites you to become a thruple. You know, um, this is what, and you may say, oh, that would never happen here. And God, thank God, it may not actually ever happen right here with you people sitting here, but it certainly is happening, um, you know, in the weekly rentals and sea pines. I mean, there's no question about that. This is just where it is. So again, this is nothing new exactly. It's just that it is being spoken about without guilt or shame, or at least ostensibly without guilt or shame, in order that people will, um, well, as we just said before, define deviancy down. Here's another sort of really fun thing that's popping up, is um, the Satanic Temple is coming to a school near you. They're having, um, in four states, um, after-school Satan clubs continues to grow as parents seek after-school education activities free from threats of eternal damnation, right? Because if you have a club that tells you you shouldn't be scared, then you won't be, right? I mean, that's the joke. You know, it doesn't really matter what uh, we say about these things. There's a reality, a truth to the world written on our hearts that is terrifying to people. So the best way that people try to deal with that is to mock it. But, it, you know, mockery ultimately will not uh, suffice because, as Paul tells us, God is not mocked. Nevertheless, there's where we are um, in our particular culture. Uh, this is happening, too. You may have seen this. At Canterbury Cathedral hosted their first um, rave in the nave, they called it, and so they had a giant sort of rave in the Canterbury Cathedral. So probably 16 times more people than have been in that church other than sort of for like state events, um, you know, for for any worship service, at at least in my surmise. And um, this is the logical end of a church that has lost any reverential fear of God. Like this is, this is what happens. Like when you, um, you know, when you have more uh, sort of sense of solemnity walking into a yoga studio than you do a cathedral, then one of those uh, situations is actually uh, believes in something higher than themselves and the other one doesn't, you know? I mean, this is just where, where this is. And so again, this is not mockery. I mean, this is the Church of England. Canterbury Cathedral is beautiful, although it is funny to see the Roman Catholics are saying, you know, give it back to us, please, you know, like we would not do this. Um, uh, although, you know, they say that there's some pretty egregious um, examples of, of some Roman Catholic churches being just as silly and just as, as lost. So there's, there's the, the original sin and the blame for the cowardice of the church uh, is equal, equal across all denominations, okay? But we're, we're, we're fighting back, you know, at least we're standing firm. I mean, not moving... You know, if you're in a rushing river and you're just a rock in the middle, no matter how big you are or how small, there's going to be turbulence around you. And that's sort of where, how I feel we are. You know, we're not some massive church. We're not a really tiny church, but we are um, standing here and there's going to be some turbulence around that. And that's just how it is. Um, but, you know, that thankfully, that's why Patrick were here. I told him Trinity School for Ministry, you know, they were like, well, let's put it this way. When I became rector in my old church years ago now, um, I asked the rector who had been 30 years there also, and I said, what's the biggest change that happened when you, uh, over your past 30 years? He says, well, when I graduated from sem- seminary, I, was see- I saw this job as more of a cruise ship captain, you know, which is not all bad. If you're on a cruise, it's a big job. You know, you got to get all the, the meals on time and all the... Um, and he says, but now I think I'm a more of a battleship captain. And I was like, well, thank goodness, you know, Trinity uh, was a battleship training school, because that's what we knew, that's what we signed up for. Um, and so, and that's, has, that has um, certainly been the case, <laughs> at least culturally speaking, you know. Um, uh, but there we go. Okay, here's something that I found interesting, and this is something that I want to tell you about. So... This is from a guy named Ryan Burge, who I, I didn't put the, um, but he, did a, he does graphs. He's like some super wonky uh, numbers nerd, and he puts all of these really interesting surveys into these graphs that people like me can easily digest, which I like. I mean, he makes money doing this. It's called graphs on religion is his thing. It's his business. So um, why evangelical is becoming another word for, quote, Republican? So in a nutshell, this is a whole big article. This is the key point. The idea is simply this. Evangelicalism used to be a term that denoted a certain adherence to a specific theology and active engagement in a Protestant community. Now, evangelicalism just means, quote, I am a conservative Republican. It's become little more than a cultural marker and has little to do with any type of religious devotion to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, I agree with that in large part. And I think that the extent to which people talk about the quote-unquote white evangelicals, they're not actually speaking theologically in any discernible or understandable way. 
Because if you define yourself as an evangelical because you are not Catholic or Jewish and you still never go to church, well, you are not in any classic sense an evangelical. Uh, because an evangelical, now I cannot let go of the word because as some of you know, it's from the Bible itself. The, the, the eungelion, katamakon, the, the, the gospel according to Mark. The eungelion, the, the good news, eungelion. So you meaning the good, uh, and angelos, from herald, herald, a proclamation. So I'm not going to give the word up, um, although you will have to qualify it all the time, because when you hear evangelicals, you want to say, well, wait a minute, do you mean the people who are saved by the blood of Christ, who go to church as often as they can, who pray, sing, and live joyful lives in the expectant hope of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting? Uh, no, we mean people that aren't Catholic or Jewish and who vote Republican. I'm like, well, we need a new word for you, not for us, you know, because you could just call them. Because if you see this, the religious attendance of self-identified evangelicals, I mean, look at this, more than half of the people um, never go. The, the sel- seldom is the orange and never is yellow. I mean, that's, so if you came to me and said, I'm an active member of this church, and I was like, how often do you come? You're like, once. I'm like, once a week? No, once, a year. Like, well, um, we need to talk (laughs) because you are not an active member and there's something dramatically wrong with your self-conception of your faith if you think that's sufficient. And this is what's interesting about this is that all of these talk about the quote-unquote evangelical decline. If you dig into this, and I have the books if you want to come read them, if you dig into the actual decline, what you'll see is that the people who don't go to church are coming to church even less than they didn't come. (laughs) In other words, like, if you used to come on Easter, now you don't come at all. If you used to come Easter and Christmas, now you just come Easter. But, if you, but the people who actually go to church on a weekly basis, who are like seeking the gifts of God for the people of God, who are living in sort of the rhythms of the church year through word and sacrament, there is, um, there's no decline in that at all. In fact, there's an uptick. You know, it's, again, it's a little bit like the marriage rates. If you dig into the divorce rates, 50% of the people are divorced. Well, let's look at that. And if you dig into it, and the people who actually are sort of taking their vows seriously, who are looking for help where it's offered, who are participating in the program that God has given us in order to maintain this very difficult relation, yet life-giving, well then the divorce rate is much, much lower than the 50% it is purported to be. But if you say, well, I'm a Christian and I got divorced, what do you mean you're a Christian? Well, it means I'm not Catholic or Jewish. It's like, well, you know, we're going to need a bit of more, well, more um, a little bit more uh, d- defining of that term, sir, you know. And so, but this, is, but this goes down the line. So do not trust anything you read in per- pretty much any um, uh, sort of, certainly mainline source, but, but any main, even, even independent journalism, when it comes to actual Christianity. Like, just don't, because unless the person is actually a Christian, they have no idea what they're talking about. And so if you're sitting on the outside trying to observe what's happening, quote-unquote, with the evangelicals, well, then you're going to have a different determination than I would use than you would use. You know, because if I say, well, wait, you mean that there's a group of people that are going to church every week who are confessing their sins, being received the body and blood of Christ, who are who are raising their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, who are fighting against sin, death, and the devil. These are the same people who, who would, um, you know, are, are the scourge of society, the biggest threat that the country has ever known, you know, as you've heard people saying, like, that's, that's not, that's just simply not true. And yet, we're going to hear about the evangelical block, the even, the mean, big mean, quote-unquote, white evangelicals, and you need to be inoculated against this because, um, because if you, again, like we said a couple weeks ago, um, there are some very clear-cut behaviors and con- convictions that the Bible lays out for what it means to be a sincere and believing Christian. And if you're transgressing those, then we should talk. If, you are, if you're wrestling with those, then you should confess. But you certainly will not hear those, those preached on or, 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 or um, sort of advocated in any way. Um, and that's uh, because we're Christians. Like, we're whatever, whatever a quote-unquote white evangelical is, I have no idea, other than at least half of them don't go to church. So it's like, well, I'm not one of those. Um, anyway, I just wanted you to read this. Oh, yeah, yes. Yes, please. I think that's so, I, I think that might be the case. I don't really know that he didn't, Yeah. 
Yes. I don't know. Yes. Don't Sorry. Know. Well, well, now I don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I'll put that one up next week. We'll get it on. We'll get on. <laughs> Who asked you? Um, <laughs> um, the point is, so now, so now I'm getting all sorry. So, the point is, don't ask questions. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but here's, but here's what's interesting. It's sort of amazing that a certain segment of the population fears the rise of a theocracy from a group of Americans, despite being only 8% of the population. So that must be what they're talking about. That the, the, I had it reversed. But at any rate, it's half of the people um, you know, who, are, who are professing evangelicals don't go to church. That's the whole point of this, is that we need to find a different category, maybe like a, a, a like confessing evangelical you know, versus a cultural evangelical or something like that. The, the whole, wait, anyway. Okay. Okay. Well, that was my point about evangelicals. You can't get rid of the. You shouldn't be afraid of the. Shouldn't be afraid of the name. It's biblical, so we can't let go of it. But at the same time, be wary of how it's used. That's that's the my admonition to you. Okay. So we're going to talk on what's called. We're going to continue theological anthropology, and I have the slides from last week that I didn't get to, but I want to, because my appeal to you is this. I'm certainly not saying it's just like a, like any like a historical claim. The past was rife and full of sinners who were abusing the grace of God if they were Christians, abusing each other if they were not Christians and just, you know, being wanton pagans. Um, And it is tempting to view, uh, like Thomas Mann said, the history of the world is nasty, brutish, and short. And that is not just relative to human history, I mean, uh, national history, that has to do with personal history as well. You, know, you don't have to go very far to get into a very dark territory, very heavy waters in any human heart, right? So particularly when we talk about important relations, most notably the relationship between men and women, you know, this is not a, uh, this is not often a, uh, uh, well, it's often a battleground. It's not a, it's not a, a, a rose garden, right? And so there's no reason to sugarcoat that at all. That being said, it uh, is not also the case that it has been nothing but a battleground at all times, and certainly any more than it has certainly been the case that it's been a rose garden. But what I want to appeal to you today is that what is transpiring at this moment is not working. Like, whatever you want to say about how things were, what is cannot be how it will be, or else we're in big trouble, really big trouble. And I'm saying this as a father of, of four boys and two girls, and if things don't change in a cultural standpoint, then both the girls and the boys are going to be in trouble going forward. And if you're not ready for that, if you don't believe that, well, I've got some, some slides to help you show that, but that's my conviction. So when I say, like, what should we do, I'm not exactly sure. You know, so I'm reading books, talking to, to people. I love having Kelly and Jen. You know, they've already gotten to, through, um, through the gauntlet you know, and out into the world. And so I'm listening to them, reading books, praying fervently, um, but at the same time uh, having to walk forward, having to, to educate and, and to equip and to discipline or to, or to praise. And that's a complicated situation, but it is an urgent one because the situation as it stands today is unsustainable. And I'm not the only one saying this, and Christians aren't the only ones saying this. Sociologists, you know, talk to a local uh, public school teacher about the state of sort of attention of boys and girls. You know, look at the stats of, of what's called OnlyFans. Do you know this thing, OnlyFans? I mean, I, thank God, uh, was not around when I was in... Um, it's, a, it's basically an online prostitution uh, market where you can um, put pictures of yourself up, and men in particular will pay you uh, in a variety of states of undress. Um, and it's a hundred billion dollar industry. It's so prevalent that in many dating apps, there's actually a question as to whether or not you're on OnlyFans. We might as well get this out of the way before we get too far down the road. I mean, that is not the sign of any sort of health. That is a sign of alarm and should be a a cause of concern. Um, And yet, it is huge. It's enormous. It's like tonight. We're gonna, I'm not gonna watch it. I don't even know who's in. I know the Chiefs, I think. Is Is it the Broncos and the Chiefs? I have no, 
I have no idea. I'm so, so thankful for that. And I love football. Football's an amazing sport, um, but not what it's become, in part because I can't handle the fact that hundreds, of, or I don't know, hundreds, but billions of dollars are going to be spent gambling on this game and destroying the lives of the people that are involved in it. You know, you could say, oh, it's only $20 here or there. Well, that's not how they make their money, no more than that's how casinos make their money. Casinos don't make their money on your bachelorette trip when you were there. They make their money on the sad souls of the people who are addicted and enslaved to the promise of easy gain and quick wealth. And that's exactly like the gambling tonight. And it's exactly like these poor boys who are uh, enslaved to their desires, who are let loose, and these girls who are enslaved to their desire to be wanted, and the vicious cycle destroys both of them. It's not like, a oh, the, the, the girls in OnlyFans are the bad ones and enticing the poor, upright, moral boys, any more than it is the, the dirty, you know, awful men that are, that are subjugating these poor, you know, virtuous women who have no other choice. It is because we are equally sinful, we have equal agency, and evil manifests itself in different ways, but equally in both men and women. I mean, women sin just as much as men do in different ways, and it is equally as sinful for a woman to use her body to, to extract money from addicted, porn-saturated boys as it is for him to want her to do that for him. And until we can come to a, a conversation about a Christian conversation, about the equal weight and equal distribution of original sin, then all we're going to have left is what we're going to talk about is this battle of the sexes, which of course now has even just transcended actual sex. And so you know, now you have men, ironically, still um, uh, sort of winning you know, all the races, and winning all the races just because they pretend to be women. And we will have this battle for increasingly seemingly scarce resources, and it will be um, a devolution of the promise, which is in the Bible, that the image of God in men and women would be something beautiful, life-giving, and sacred. But that is a long way from OnlyFans. It's a long way from, from, from what we see today. And so, again, I'm, I'm not professing to have any uh, magic pill or silver bullet, um, and, and if, if I, I, I wish there were. But we're, we're in a situation where we have to at least come to grips with the dire straits we're in in order to have some way to pray and some hopeful expectation of how to get out of the situation. Okay. Um, again, I mention these books all the time. I, we need to get them in the bookstore. I can't recommend them highly enough. I haven't read this Genesis Agenda entirely, but this Feminism Against Progress, it's Mary Harrington. Um, it's, uh, what does it say, like downing a packet of tang, tang fastics after a lifetime of gruel. I have no idea what a tang fastic is. It must be like, um, yeah, it must be like, um, like C.S. Lewis's ad, you know, like we're content with playing with mud pies because we've never actually had a real pie. You know, that must be the idea. And her argument, as I said before, and if I sound like a broken record, it's because I, I can't, I'm stuck on, on thinking about these things, and so I'm just confessing that. Um, but her whole argument is that, the, uh, that there are biological and therefore created differences between men and women. I mean, that's just, that's the whole thing. And that is something contrary to what she was taught, contrary to what she tried to live out, and then when she got married and had a baby, not that that's the silver bullet, but there is a pattern there, then an entire world opened up to her, and now she's spending her time, as it were, repenting and, and being restored. I mean, that's what the whole book's about. Um, and it doesn't mean, I mean, she's got a degrees, and she speaks, and she's got a career, and all this stuff. Um, so it's not, not an appeal to the good old days, but it was appeal to the bad situation that she has been removed from and that many of the OnlyFans girls and the boys who, are, who, are, um, who think this is now a normative way of courtship or whatever um, are still enslaved to. And so, you know, I, you guys may not have fears of the internet in this respect the way that I do, but I've got four little boys, and, um, and I'm, I'm not terrified, but I'm, I'm, um, we're preparing ourselves, right? Um, so, why do I bring all this up? So there's a death this week by Letha Dawson Scanzioni, pioneer of quote-unquote evangelical feminism, and um, she died at 88 in books like, quote, all we're meant to be, and quote, is the homosexual my neighbor. She used the Bible to challenge beliefs that women were inferior to men and that homosexuality was a sin. Okay, well, you know, this, again, is where we have to, to take back. This is someone in the New York Times writing about what supposedly the Bible teaches. The Bible has never, nor will it ever teach, that the women are inferior to men um, in, in equal, uh, in, in equality or dignity or worth before God. 
It has never, never um, said that. It has said that there are various strengths and weaknesses relative to each other that need to be addressed and compensated for. Uh, most notably, throughout most of human history, it was a big deal to be weaker than someone else. Right? And so if you were particularly going to be laid up for nine months and then straddled uh, with a child for the rest of your, ostensibly the rest of your life, it would be helpful for you to have a big, strong person who would protect you from wolves and from arrows during that time in particular. That was just sort of an understood. And so whatever you want to say about the relationship, that was a dance that was life-giving and supportive, even if it wasn't sort of deeply romantic in the way that the um, German idealists want it to be. Right? Because this is sort of the, the, um, the trade-off you know, that, that took, the great, the great sort of bartering that took place. Um, because the Bible does not teach, as I said before, anything other than, than equal dignity and worth before God for men and women. And so much so that it's not just the man or just the woman that is the image of God himself, but them together. Like, how could that possibly be anything other than an equal and sort of equally dignified relation? Um, but it does, in fact, teach that homosexuality is a sin. And yet, if you begin to undermine the foundations of that statement that men and women are different, albeit equal, before God from the Scriptures, and don't take into account how those differences are articulated through the Bible, well, then you're going to open the door for an allowance of all the things well, you're going to be able to, to turn the Bible into a, um, into, uh, make it say whatever you'd like it to say. This is the hardest part about, about this whole discussion, is that not everyone, there are women who are ordained in our church, who believe the Bible, who love the Bible, who, who, are, who are committed evangelicals in the proper sense. There are, there are um, you, you know, the ACNA, as we'll talk about, was founded with a compromise between people who have disagreements about this but are all committed to the sufficiency and authority and inerrancy of Scripture. That is a different way of arguing than this woman, Lynn Letha Dawson Scanzioni, began to argue and ultimately ended up at the end of her life. So Letha Dawson Scanzioni, an evangelical author, who argued gently but persuasively that the Bible considered women equal to men, which is, which is totally true, inspiring a wave of Christian feminism, and perhaps inevitably, am I getting, uh, getting this is a sign to stop talking, that's right, that's right. Um, <laughs> I mean, we have to talk about these things. Um, uh, she had the same questions as her secular sisters. Should women be submissive to their husbands and stay out of leadership roles in the church as many fundamentalist Christians believed? Well, those are actually just quotes from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, to, from, to, from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church. These are literally quotes from the Bible that uh, we're going to talk about from Ephesians chapter 5, that women should be submissive to their husbands um, and that women should not have the final and ultimate uh, role of authority in leading the church. And the reason for this is because the Bible is very clear about, as we talked about last week, the roles and responsibilities of men and women within the family, and the church is a large family. And so the same situations and roles apply. But if anyone, and this is what's so sad for me, it's like the people have never read anything before 1940. The idea that women in particular had no what we would call soft power in a family is the, is the most laughable thing that I could ever have imagined. In fact, you could almost argue that whatever sort of titular head men have had throughout history has actually been the matriarch of the family that's called all the shots. And that's so obvious and so clear, and yet because it was technically, um, you know, he was the president of this company, but his, uh, you know, his wife was actually the one that, that ran everything. I mean, you know, behind every great man is a, is a greater woman or whatever the saying goes. That's a true thing. You know, I mean, Helen of Troy launched a thousand ships. I guarantee if I had been on one of those ships, I would not have wanted to go fight for her. I wouldn't have even seen her. And yet that was the power that women had and do, in fact, still have. And yet this idea that because of... Um, because, again, the, the, we're going to go too far afield. But, but this is the problem, is that there are ways to understand submission and authority. There are ways to understand leadership in the church that allow for the flowering, the mutual flourishing of both men and women in the body of Christ. Why would God have designed the family in the way that he did if it hadn't been for the good of both men and women? Why would he then have said the household of God should be set up similarly if it hadn't been good for men and women? And yet, if you don't believe in God, then you come, like the quote-unquote evangelical who doesn't go to church ever, well, you come to the Bible with a whole different set of assumptions, namely, is this for me or against me? And if it's possibly against you, well, then I need to make it fix it, and I need to undermine it, I need to undercut it, and I need to edit it. 
And that's what's happened. That's what's happened, not across the board. Again, we've got book, chapter, and verse about all these things we can show you. Um, but suffice it to say that um, you, it's very hard to read um, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, where it says, um, well, we're going to read it. Uh, well, I'll just read it right now. It's very hard to make this sound. Hold on, Galatians, Ephesians. One of the easiest ways people get around this, and I spent way too long in the Episcopal Church and the Church of England to have any time for this argument, if anyone wants to make it to me, don't bother, that perhaps Paul didn't write any of this. Like, not even, we're not even, like, that's, a, that's, that's one of the, fa- the easiest ways, like, well, that's pseudepigraphal. Maybe it was a later edition. Maybe that was Paul. This is not a Christian argument to be made, and so we're not going to, we're not going to make it. We're not going to have it. Um, Oh yeah, oh yeah, or or yeah, that's Paul. You know, Paul was Paul was the problem, as if Paul wasn't inspired by God to be one of his apostles to to write the 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 word revealed through the Spirit to him. I mean, this is again, um, I've been through it all. But um, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now the church, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Well, if you take the, the hermeneutical step that this woman, Leda Dawson Scanzioni, did, you actually turn this into wives do not submit your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is not the head of the wife, even though Christ is perhaps the head of the church, his body, and is himself his possible savior. Now as the church root, uh, regular, or, you know, um, at times submits to Christ, um, so also wives should not submit in everything to their husbands. I mean, this is, this is how you make this read. And so, again, yes, ma'am. If we start with the verse before that, it says all submit That's exactly right. That's right. But how does that submission... That's exactly right. No, no, they should. Well, there's... Argue, there's, 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 there's a, there is a, sort of... There's, there's an argument from the Greek to be made for either putting... So what Sandra's saying is in the beginning, right before the wives submit your own husbands, we have, um, we have this statement, uh, da, 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 addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. That's exactly right. But what does that submission look like? It doesn't look like the same thing. The submission looks like wives submitting to their husbands, and the submission of husbands looks like laying down his life for, this, for his wife. But that is the mutual submission. And that is why um, it's difficult, you know? It's like I said a couple of weeks ago, like I, you know, I have not been called to be, uh, have someone lay down their life for me. You know, women and children first. I mean, that, that was, that's a Christian idea. Where we see that recede, we see women and children are prey, not to be, uh, we, we see that we are prey upon women and children. And we've seen this all around the world. And that's exactly what happens outside of a Christian context. And yet what I've been called to do is actually be the protector of the otherwise prey, which are women and children. I mean, this is, this is how this is. And, and so where you don't see that, you see like, remember the Italian cruise ship guy when the, the, he, the captain jumped off first, you know, knocking little kids out of the way, you know? I'd like to believe that if I were on a sinking ship, that I would, well, I have to believe this, that I would put Laza and the kids on first, you know? But I know a heck of a lot of men who wouldn't, and they probably don't go to church at all, you know? They're, they're evangelicals who go to church once a... Once a um, but here's, here's the thing. We have to come to the Bible with an ex- expectation that we're not going to understand it all initially. It's not a simplistic thing, you know? This is, a, this is not something, but it is a, to our good, I mean, I go to this passage every single... I'm jumping... I had a bunch of, I had a bunch of slides, but we'll just jump into it. Um, uh, th- uh, this was at the end. I go to this passage every single time I do pre-marriage counseling uh, because, because invariably, even if the people... And I don't do these weddings anymore, but I used to do weddings with people that would fall into the, to the evangelical camp like we decided. You know, I've never seen them before, and they, they'll come to church for a couple of weeks to get, so that they can get and use the building. Um, and I thought that was an opportunity, right? And to a person, almost to a person, they'd say, well, I'd be like, what readings do you want from the Bible for your, for your marriage or for your wedding? Like, well, we don't really know a lot of them, but I know one that we're not going to have. And it's the one somewhere in the back where it says, wives, submit to your husband, you know? And usually it's, um, you know, they sort of laugh knowingly because I'm the Episcopalian supposed to be like, that's just Paul, you know, that's just Paul. And I say, well, let's talk about that. 
And so we begin to at least discuss the fact that at the end of the day, there has to be, or there's going to be a division of labor, there's going to be a mis an understanding of roles and responsibilities, and you either gonna make it up, in which case, you know, good, good luck, or you're gonna submit to something higher and more uh, sort of uh, longer lived than you, and hopefully avoid some of the problems that are inherent to being a human being, like husbands lording over their wives, this, their strength and sort of, um, or, or, or women, um, you know, manipulating and or, you know, uh, not respecting and sort of, uh, you know, the, the way that, that, that we, we have seen. Um, or you're going to prayerfully uh, look for something good in this relation that God has um, called you to. And so we go through this, and I say, you know, if the, if the challenge, Paul was writing to us with an understanding of where our weaknesses would lie, because it will be difficult, just, just as a, a point of information, it is not easy for wives to respect their often uh, um, unrespectable husbands. <laughs> it's not easy for that. Like, that is not something that comes natural. You know, particularly if your husband is not prone for, like, detail-oriented. I'm not speaking about myself, I'm just saying in, in theory. Or um, has trouble, you know, managing his finances, loses his job, might fall into fits of despair and doesn't feel like he's, you know, amounted to anything, isn't as successful as his brother, and so on and so forth. You might have a difficult time respecting that man, and yet that's where you begin to pray. Because what he needs at that point, according to God himself through his inspired writer Paul, is your respect. And that is something which will not come naturally, but it will come supernaturally when we pray and ask. And if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't believe it. I haven't experienced it. You know, I mean, thank God. Now, conversely, what are men called to do? Lay down your lives as Christ loved the church. Well, guess what? That's not easy either. <laughs> You know, it's much more fun to buy a ski boat than it is to send another kid to college. You know, it is much more fun than that. And yet, that's not what you were called to do. You were called to lay down your life. Well, that means I have to take a second job. That means I have to get up at four in the morning. That means I have to not slap this kid when he talks back to me. That means, I mean, you know, <laughs> for instance, you know, like, you mean I have to do all the things like Christ did for me, forgive me, and to be long-suffering and patient and not exasperate and so on and so forth? Well, I don't want to do that either. Well, you have to. Well, why do I have to? Because that's what you've been called to, this vocation, this gift, this new life. And if it wasn't undergirded by Jesus and his mercy itself, well, then it'd be impossible. And that's what we're watching. That's what we're looking at. Because there is no question that the, the relationship between men and women outside of the loving, regenerative uh, spirit of God himself would be fraught, to put it lightly. Um, and there have been horrific abuses both ways. You know, there have been, and you find people increasingly not even wanting to get involved. You know, the number of sort of 30 and unders who say prioritize their life, their, their career and their friends over the prospect of getting ma married is like doubling every generation, I mean every year, because they look at what a non-Christian marital relationship would be like and say, rightly, I want none of that. You know, I, want, I don't want any of that. Um, you know, I can make my own money on OnlyFans. I, I can sleep with as many women as I want without settling down. You know, I can do this without that sort of baggage. And yet here we are saying, listen, you don't have to be married to be a Christian. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institution of God, nevertheless, that this side of heaven was given as a protectorate and a, a um, sort of a, a fort. You know, I put up a picture of a, a lighthouse that's being crushed by a wave whenever I teach, um, when I go through um, premarital counseling. And I said, this is the picture the marriage is supposed to be. Not game over, but like a protective lighthouse in the middle of a storm. And if it's not that way, I tell my pre-marriage people, then we should get together because it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, there are days and there are days, but if in general, this is not the experience that you're having in your marital relation, well, then we should talk because something's wrong and something's just flatly wrong. And again, that doesn't mean that, that we can't fix it, you know, but I, I lay out these, these warning lights, you know, I do premarital counseling and I was like, here's some warnings, you know, finances, family, um, you know, sort of intimate life, like there's some, there's some check engine now lights that we're going to give you, and if they start going off, well then you, we should talk, you know, we can help you. I mean, they're, they've gone off in my life, they've gone off in other people's lives, and we're still here, you know, like, but there's routine maintenance, um, which includes going to church, by the way, you know, includes confessing and praying and singing, um, and if you don't do that, well, then you're in trouble, you know, I mean, this is just how it is.
Okay, uh, we're gonna, this is what I was, this is, these are the ga graphs I was tr trying to show you. Um, the men and women, these are men turning more conservative and women turning more liberal. These are just, I don't know how exactly they're determining that, but nevertheless, there's a divergence. And it's an alarming divergence um, of being seen across societies. And I would argue that the divergence is in part because if we are left to our own devices in a world without Jesus, i.e. non-Christian world, well then we will return to a much baser state of existence, which is, looks a lot more like um, dog-eat-dog dog or sort of the rule of the jungle than it did any sort of beautiful dance between men and women. And we've seen, obviously, we see examples, sadly, of that all around the world even today, but we're starting to see that in places that used to be characterized by, at the very least, um, sort of civilization bounded by this implicit dance between men and women, right? And so as that recedes, we're seeing um, this uh, this sort of animus, this deep-rooted animus between men and women resurfacing, which is nothing other than demonic, but in fact is the result of sin in the world. Your desire will be for your husband, and yet he will rule over you. And to the man, he says, you will work like a dog for nothing. Like, that's what's going to happen. Th 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 thistles and thorns shall you grow, and you dust you came from, and to dust you will return. Well, that left in and of itself provides fodder for quite angry people, <laughs> like very angry people. And we are in the de-escalation business here in the church, because we're going to say, listen, you might have a lot of reasons to be angry, but, um, but let me tell you what Jesus has done to save, right? Okay, this is where this is a harrowing. Um, yeah, it says this, there may not have always been, uh, this leads to the second cause of the divergence, the broader West leftward lurch coupled with feminism. That just means that's not the good type feminism. That's the feminism that denies any intrinsic difference between men and women. That's not the one that says women should vote, okay, just to be clear. Um, has in fact created a zero sum environment where women's gains are increasingly men's losses. This may not have always been the case, but as women being part of the workforce has become normalized, our population continues to grow and economic growth has exceeded the point of diminishing returns, there may not be enough to go around, forcing men and women to fight for benefits and resources like never before. I can't think of another moment in history in any civilization where men and women were each other's primary competitor the historical norm is one group of men and one versus, versus another group of men and women, unprecedented indeed. This is all uncomfortable to talk about, so much of it offensive to what we come to regard as gospel sacrosanct values. But if you're a believer of science, just look at it biologically. With nothing to fight for, nothing to build, nobody to look out for, men will either engage in self-destructive behavior, including suicide, or take out those impulses against others, becoming a threat to society. No amount of women's empowerment can defend against that. Likewise, if women cannot fulfill their biologically defined roles, they too will become self-destructive in other ways and engage in behavior that may not directly threaten society by their own hand, but will still manage to get others killed. Does that sound like a promising future? Well, indeed it does not. Nevertheless, as I said last week, and we gotta go. Oh, there's the OnlyFans stuff. There's the people, smash the patriarchy. Um, is, I, I say I had a plan. Um, this is what we have lost in this fight is this, um, you know, no one wants to say this, uh, this, this vow anymore. It's in the 1662 prayer book. Um, will I have my woman, will I love her, comfort her, honor her, keep her in sickness and in health, for forsaking all others, keep thee only unto her for as long as you both shall live? And the man says, I will. And then the woman says, will I have this man to be their hus husband, to live together in God's ordinance and the holy state of matrimony? Will they obey him, serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him as long as you both shall live? Well, there was a compromise there. There was, a, there was, a, there was a, an agreement, an arrangement um, that had two sides. Um, and one of the sides was this, um, that for, better, for richer, better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. And then, of course, this other one. And then finally, remember, the man was the only one that gave rings back in the day. And with this ring I thee wed, with my body I thee worship, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, again, I, I will take that. I will take that. Um, but it wasn't mine to give. It wasn't mine to receive. It was mine to give, in fact. And I will suggest to you that with few exceptions, with exceptions, I'm sure, but people whose lives were characterized not by once-a-year worship or once-a-year prayers, 
but were in fact marked by a fervent and persistent devotion and love to their Savior, manifest through weekly worship, through prayer and devotion and sacrifice, I would suggest to you that those people had no problem saying these vows on either a man's side or a woman's side, historically speaking. There's a lot of change that come this way. And I would suggest to you that there is a goodness to the the picture that is depicted in the Bible that has been manifested and carried down through the church, and that that is something that we actually have to offer the world. Like the OnlyFans girl can be forgiven and be restored. Like the, the cad who has you know, countless sort of you know, sexual encounters um, in his life can be forgiven and restored, and they can be reconciled one unto another. And as it were, I had this, uh, lay their weapons down. And they can be an armistice, as it were. I'm no longer going to objectify you by your body. I'm no longer going to use my body to, to manipulate and, and seduce you for money. We're going to actually live together and be one flesh, the image of God, this side of heaven. And I think that's a beautiful picture. I, I live it by God's grace. Um, but I see the sadness around people that are, uh, that are professing that there's nothing wrong. This is all great. You know, this is, this is just how it should be. This, I'm so empowered and so in love to, to live online and watch porn all day long. I'm so empowered and, and alive to, to sacrifice and sell my body online to, to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there is just such a deep and sad vacuousness and, and forlornness about it that it's heartbreaking. And as I look at my six little kids, I'm like, we want something not only better, but more beautiful and true for you. And that's not just for them, but for, the, for all of the kids. And so pray for this. Pray for your nieces and nephews and grandchildren and granddaughters, grandsons and granddaughters. And don't give up hope, because just as it was a radical, life-changing message back then, we, it will be and is still today. And that each and every person brought out of darkness and into light is one more um, voice joining the chorus of angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing these hymns to the glory of God's name. So let's pray. Lord, be with us now. Give us um, grace, comfort, and um, hope in the midst of the world, the time that you have called us to live in. Give us um, courage of our convictions. Let us be gentle and humble. Let us um, learn from each other uh, what uh, it means to be the body of Christ. Um, We thank you uh, for your mercies, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Next week, uh, I will be in the discovery class, so um, we haven't decided exactly what will be happening here, but we might have a missions presentation. Anyway, come back or come there. Either way, see you soon.